The number three Iowa Hawkeyes faced off against the number eight Virginia Tech Hokies in a ally partnership matchup in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was everything you could have expected. It lived up to the hype. You had Caitlin Clark, of course, matched up against Georgia Amor and Elizabeth Kidley. Obviously, they had Kayla King and Matilda Eck. So um, this was a matchup for the ages, and um, it was really, really, really good. A lot of Virginia Tech fans talked about the refereeing of the game. They felt like Caitlin Clark had a lot of calls going in her favor. They felt like she was initiating a lot of contact. They felt like, you know, on the other side of the ball, they wasn't getting the necessary calls that they wanted. So, you know, that's that's par for the course, obviously. You know, since Caitlin Clark is getting all this hype and all of the attention that she's garnering, you know, a lot of people feel a, type of, a certain type of way. So a lot of people feel like she's getting those superstar calls that you would see in the NBA and things like that. But, hey, that's par for the course. That's what happens when you have a player of her caliber really, you know, showing that she's in attack mode. Now we're starting to see, like, a lot of people starting to say, okay, she's a crybaby. She's crying to the ref. She's flopping and things like that. So you're going to see a lot more of that as she, as her fame and her stardom continues to rise. So a lot of people are going to be, you know, anything she does is going to be under the microscope. So, but um, Georgia Amor, like, let's really talk about her game. She's obviously projected to be like in the top 10. Some has her going even as high as top seven in the WNBA draft. Her and Elizabeth Kitley, to be honest. So they're both first round picks, you know, two first round picks on the same team. And um, that's tough. Like that's tough, especially going against Iowa. So just looking at that, you know, you got one, the number one pick, you know, projected number one pick going against two top 10 picks who, you know, are gonna be phenomenal players in their own right. That speaks to just the greatness that we're seeing in women's basketball. That speaks to the greatness that, you know, Caitlin Clark is possessing to be able to take those two players down. Like, that's crazy. You know, that's that's really understated. Going back to Georgia Amor, though, just her ability to really navigate those ball screens. Like, she's phenomenal at that. And she's very great as a shot creator, like as a three-point shot creator at that. So that going left, that step back, that's lethal like she has a lot of bounce in her jump shot so she gets up quick she gets up high and it's very little you can do as a defender so that's why you were able to see her put up you know 30 some odd points and um she really had a great game now elizabeth kitley on the other hand she had 16 points 16 rebounds very great game but she still didn't get you know all the way into her rhythm she didn't really get to really dominate the game like that and um, a lot of that, you know, credit to Hannah Stolke, who was playing on her, Sharon Goodman, who was playing on her. And, you know, they gave her really good minutes. So in the future, you will want to see Elizabeth Kelly really try to establish herself. So make no mistake about it, you have to double team her now. And at that point, you open up all the shooters that are around her. So I feel like if Virginia Tech, you know, going forward, you got to really establish her early and really get her to, you know, make the defense overreact to her. The thing that made it kind of tough for Georgia Amor. Now she was still able to get what she wanted, but in the key moments of the game, there were great possessions of her being guarded by Gabby Marshall, who, you know, got some key stops or at least made her, you know, made it a little bit tough on her. So she would have some key misses down the stretch of the game. And uh, some of the, you know, she had some air balls, some, you know, just clanks off the rim, but overall she had a great game, but that's what you want out of, out of a defender on her is just make her miss in those key moments. And I think uh, Iowa did a pretty good job of doing that. Now, obviously, you know, much has been talked about with Caitlin Clark. She had an incredible performance. So, you know, a lot of people are giving her praises, but a lot of people are also, you know, talking, you know, crap about her, you know, really talking about the struggle she had. And she did kind of struggle, especially against Virginia Tech and their length, especially at the beginning of the game. Um, I think they gave her a different look that she wasn't really accustomed to. And obviously this is a, you know, this is the first time she's going against a, a really quality team without her star, you know, a star duo, you know, somebody that's established like a Monica Sinano. And um, this is really the, the first test for them, you know, just being able to see what do they have in, in the other teammates. So her teammates not being able to really provide that relief when their shots not falling. That really, you know, makes it easier for the defense to really, you know, focus in and hone in on Caitlin Clark and make it really difficult for her. So they was throwing, you know, traps. They was throwing high hedges at her. Um, they had a bigger, taller defender on her. 
Kayla King and Matilda Eck. They did a phenomenal job. So then you had Kitley's, who's a 6'6 center, really, you know, showing high or, you know, sometimes she would drop. But they kind of just tried to switch it up, make it, you know, um, un unpredictable for her, like just making her second guess herself and things like that. So, but at the end of the day, it's still Caitlin Clark. So she was able to really overcome that and really, you know, find her spots, find where, you know, the gaps in the defense were and really attack that. So I think down the stretch, she really did a good job at that. Now, going back to our teammates, there's a lot to be said about them and their play. Um, I think it was very polarizing. You know, you had good and you had bad, good, bad, and ugly. Um, so there were key moments in the game where individual players just really stepped up. Sydney Afolter was huge on the glass. Um, I think Hannah Stokey, although she fouled out, she did a pretty good job holding her own against Elizabeth Kitley. You know, Iowa went small. So I think she did did a good, pretty good job on Kitley. Um, then you had Gabby Marshall obviously playing phenomenal defense on Georgia Amor. Like I said, Georgia Amor was able to get off, you know, get 30 points. But I felt like in the critical moments of the game, Gabby Marshall really stepped up and really locked in. Um, Kylie Fairback. Uh, now, I remember talking about over the summer, um, the players I think should step up for Iowa this, this um, upcoming season. And uh, I had Taylor McKay. I, th I thought she really was going to be able to really step up this season because of her ability to space the floor, her her ability to shoot very quickly, and just the defense can't sag off of her. They can't um, really not focus in on her, like because she's always moving and her shot is super quick. It's like a almost like a Steph Curry type of shot where she gets it off quickly. So you always have to be mindful of those players, and I thought that would be able to really take pressure off of Caitlin Clark. But in the comment section of that same video. A lot of people were talking about, man, why aren't you talking about Kylie Fearback? Um, she's coming back from an injury, ACL injury, I believe. And um, she's going to be nice. Like, she's going to be. So I kind of overlooked her. I'm not going to lie. I was, gonna, uh, I was looking at stats a little bit too much. And I was like, ah, I don't see it, you know. But I did kind of look at her highlights when I when somebody made that comment. And I, I kind of reevaluated my assessment of her. And uh, I was like, man, she's an incredible defender. Like, just going back and looking at her highlights. I was like, man, incredible defender, really good, you know, hands, real, real good at moving her feet. And she's a big, you know, she's a wing or a guard, but she's, she's big. She, she's got size on her. So, and she moved really well. And that was the key, I think, to this game because her dribble penetration game really stood out. Obviously, she's still a great defender. That's going to be there. But I feel like off the dribble, she really helped this game because i was going to need somebody besides caitlin clark that can get downhill and and really put some pressure on that defense and i feel like she did a really good job an underrated job of doing that and um she's hitting her shots as well we seen the ankle breaker when she did a little jab step and then you know hit the three Everybody went crazy and you know they're gonna need that and I think this is a good game for her, especially playing against a Virginia Tech team one of the top 10 teams in the league so this is a big moment for her and I think Lisa Bluter should really reward her for this game but I also still want to see Taylor McKay don't get it wrong I think she still could provide an incredible offensive spark to this team now as I said before Caitlin Clark has been you know getting a lot of credit a lot of attention lately so now she's getting a lot of haters you know a lot of virginia tech fans were kind of mad about her and a lot of people just in general not really like her you know the amount of attention she's getting you know and that's obviously like any star player lebron james kobe bryant uh michael jordan larry bird like going back in the day like if you're going to be a great player and you're going to get all that attention there's going to be hate like you just gotta that just comes with the territory it comes with the dollars like you want to make all the money you, you want the money that's going to come from that you want the nil deals that's going to come with that the sponsorships you got to take the you know the good with the bad so people are going to be talking trash as well so there's this bs narrative going around about her not being able to play defense listen man she's playing 40 minutes a game all attention is on her if her teammates is not scoring, it makes it way easier to guard her. 
yes, yeah, sure, she's not going to be able to really just lock in on both sides of the ball. Playing 40 minutes a game, you want to guard the best players. You want to, you know, slide her feet all around. You want her to run, control the whole offense. That's just not going to happen. And for her team to be good as they are, they're, they're the number three team in the in the, in the the league, in the um, NCAA right now. So for her to maintain that, she's going to have to take those shots. She's going to have to be, you know, that player for her team. So to discredit her defense, you clearly don't know what you're watching. There are plenty of stretches in the game where you do see the potential of her defense. She's able to slide her free. She's not just lost out there. Like she may conserve her energy and you can kind of see that on the offensive side of the ball as well. Oftentimes you will see her dribbling the ball up very slow. She'll be, you know, very methodical with how she approaches it. She's not going full speed on offense all the time. She's slowed down, you know, analyzing the defense. And that's just, that allows her to play that full 40 minutes and be there for her team the whole game. You have to understand that. Um, People talk about, you know, oh, she shot, you know, 31, you know, um, field goal attempts or whatever, and 17 free throw attempts and things like that. But it's like, who else going to shoot those shots? Like, come on, let's be real. Like, <laughs> that, that's just what it is. Um, and her team is willing to live with it and end out with that. So, obviously, that the energy component, the pacing, um, and making strategic bursts of speed. Like you'll see her, you know, the defense playing her some certain way. She'll be dribbling it up slow and then she'll just take off, change of speed, change of pace, and really just burst down downhill. For her to have that high of a usage rate, obviously she's gonna shoot those shots. She's gonna get a lot of shots up. Um, but for her to only have one turnover over two two games with that big of a usage rate, like that's unheard of. That shows her that shows her growth as a playmaker because last year and the years prior, she got a lot of turnovers. So for her to really be cutting down on her turnovers while maintaining that high usage rate, that speaks to her in her decision making and her you know IQ as a player, and that will translate extremely well to the WNBA once the talent evens out and she's able to play with somebody like a, a Leah Boston or if she goes to you know Phoenix Mercury play with a Brittany Griner or if she goes to Seattle play with a Jewel Lloyd like that's gonna cut out she got players quality players now around her so she doesn't have to really you know dominate the ball like that and she obviously she, she's not a player that you look at and be like oh she can't play with another player because she can play all ball she can pass the ball she can play off ball she come off screens she she could do it on the ball. It, it doesn't matter. So this this BS narrative it's a lazy narrative at that because you know of course she's gonna shoot all those shots like and and obviously when we talk about the the volume and okay she should have somebody said oh she should have had seventy points on thirty on thirty shots or whatever it's the beginning of the season so she got to she got to get her win back you know this not you know. This is not February, March, going into that, where it's like, okay, she's been doing this. She's in a rhythm. She's got her all her win, and, you know, and her shot is consistent. You know, it's going to take some time to get to that point, but I'm not worried about that at all. I want her to keep shooting. She has the green light. Even in the WNBA, keep shooting. Like, once she get established, there's nothing you can do with her. So, yeah, lazy narrative. And I think people really don't know what they're talking about half the time. At the end of the day, here's the moral of the story. It doesn't matter how many shots you put up. It doesn't matter, you know, you shooting whatever percentage you shooting. Are you able to step up in those key moments? Down the stretch of this game, Caitlin Clark was amazing. She hit some really big shots. She made great plays down the stretch, made the right decision almost every time down the stretch. That's a winning player. So a lot of people, you know, like to say, oh, she's James Harden, she's you know, these players who just score a lot, but it's empty stats. I heard somebody say empty stats, right? There's no such thing as empty stats if you win the game. And if you're the reason for winning the game at that, nobody can question that. If Iowa wins, it's because of Caitlin Clark. Obviously, she has contributions from other players, but without Caitlin Clark, that's the engine to your team. So it's a lazy narrative to say she has empty stats. So the moral of the story is, Regardless of what your percentages are, can you step up and make shots at the critical moments of the game? And the answer to that question is yes, Caitlin Clark can.